and uh, really really nice to have you here so you know as always would be great to start a little bit with your story so sort of the story of william would be would be a wonderful setting point sure sure thanks uh, Rohan, for having me uh, again on your program so my story is um, i was born in lebanon and i moved to canada when i was 17 that was in 1976 uh, we moved because of the war, uh, the civil war that was going on at the time. Uh, my father moved us all um, to Canada, and we landed in Montreal uh, because we spoke French. Uh, I did not speak English very well back in '76. Uh, English was more of a third language uh, uh, that was uh, started only in high school. Uh, but French was a fluent language uh, that I knew, so uh, Montreal wa was the place that made sense. And then uh, I, we stayed here, I went to university uh, to, uh, in Seattle at the University of Washington. And uh, Vancouver uh, in British Columbia became our home in, uh, in Canada. Uh, then after university, I uh, started my first job uh, in 1982 uh, at Hewlett Packard. Uh, I was uh, at the time uh, 23. Uh, so uh, that was my first job. Uh, I was in sales at HP in the medical uh, division. Uh, we used to sell uh, diagnostic equipment and patient monitoring equipment. And uh, HP was the leader in, the, uh, in that segment at the time. Uh, and I stayed at HP for uh, a good 14 years. So a lot of my formative years uh, happened at HP. And at that time, HP was the most admired company year after year after year uh, in the Fortune rankings, and mm -hmm. HP was growing like gangbusters. When I started, uh, HP was a two and a half billion dollar company. When I left in 1995, HP was 32, 34 billion dollar uh, in terms of sales. And uh, I learned a lot from HP. Uh, I had uh, different roles there. Uh, later, I joined the computer division. Uh, I was a sales manager, marketing manager, national ma not marketing manager, uh, a national sales manager. Uh, at one point, I was in charge of re-engineering. In 1995, uh, I realized that the internet was going to be big. Yeah. So uh, I jumped uh, on board. I became involved with the HP internal uh, initiatives. At the time, it was called the Information Highway uh, in '94. Uh, and then '95, I decided to uh, to leave HP and become uh, uh, on my own a consultant. I wanted to write books, okay. uh, so that internet commerce was going to be uh, a big thing. Uh, so I left HP in '95, became a consultant, uh, and then uh, wrote a couple of books. And then I started to write, uh, to uh, do consulting, and to also uh, speak. Uh, on the topic of internet commerce and internet business uh, and uh, did that for 10 years up until uh, 2005. Uh, then I decided to go back to uh, the corporate world. Uh, so I joined uh, Aberdeen, uh, a, a research company yeah. in Boston for a few months, six months. And then uh, I went on to work for Cognizant, Cognizant Technology Solutions out of Chennai, <laughs> uh, your home. Uh, I was the head of global marketing uh, out of Teaneck, New Jersey. So although I was living in Toronto, uh, my office really was in Teaneck. Uh, we were a very global company. So it really didn't matter where you lived. Uh, and uh, all the work was global. Uh, we would get on a plane and get somewhere. And we'd have conference calls at 11 in the evening because of India time yeah. uh, on a routine. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Uh, and in 2008, uh, I decided to uh, jump ship again and uh, become an entrepreneur one more time. Uh, and I founded my first uh, startup at the time, uh, Equentio. Uh, and then uh, a year ago, I uh, founded the Engageo, uh, which was a pivot uh, and a spin out of uh, Equentio. So uh, to sum it up, uh, I went from a big company to a small company, to a big company, and back to a small company. So this is kind of the fourth stage of my uh, career. Wow, that, that's, that's quite a story. So uh, now, if you could tell us a little bit more about uh, the logo in the background, about Engageo, that would be, that would be, that would be great. Sure, sure. Actually, that logo you see there is just being changed. Uh, we're launching next week a new logo, which you probably, uh, I, I should have put it there, but we don't, we don't have it yet in the print 
it's only electronic. Uh, okay. uh, but, uh, we'll, we'll probably slide it somewhere in the in the post. Uh, we've uh, twisted the the logo, and now uh, the E is like an at. Uh, you know the at sign, yeah. the at uh, of the email, because it symbolizes uh, engagement as the new email, as as the new kind of communication uh, segment that's out there. Uh, so we've simplified the logo and really made the E look like a, the at. And, and uh, that, that will be a logo that you'll be seeing uh, starting uh, in the next few days uh, going forward. Brilliant. And, so so uh, why Engageo? What is Engageo about? And, and what, 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 is, uh, what is the vision? Sure, sure. Uh, so we're based in Toronto. Uh, uh, I am uh, right now at uh, uh, the intersection of Young and King, which is known as the financial district. Uh, that's where all the banks are. It's okay. uh, one block A Street, which is uh, the equivalent of the Wall Street for Toronto. But this has become also the place where a lot of the uh, Toronto startups are. Uh, between where I am here in this building and about um, 10 blocks uh, going that way, uh, going to the west of uh, Green Street, uh, there's probably about 100 startups uh, wow. in, in Toronto. So it's becoming really uh, a, uh, a good uh, a hub uh, for, for, for new startups uh, that are emerging. So Engageo, uh, as you know, started <laughs> out of Fred Wilson's blog, uh, uh, you and I being uh, prolific uh, commenters, uh, we, uh, we know what it's like to, to comment a lot. And the need I saw uh, at the beginning was that uh, I was commenting here and there and everywhere, uh, not just on blogs, but also having conversations on social networks. Uh, I was finding it difficult to keep track of all of these discussions I was having. Uh, then it dawned on me that why not put all of that into one place? Why not aggregate and unify all of these discussions uh, into one place, uh, like like email? Uh, so I went to, uh, I called Fred Wilson and I said, what do you think of the idea? Uh, that was almost exactly a year ago, in October of 2001. Uh, Fred really liked the idea. He said, do it. Uh, make it look like Gmail. Uh, and we did. And we did that in nine weeks. Uh, we had a, uh, a minimum viable product, which we launched on the abc.com uh, blog. As you know, our story is well known, especially with the ABCers. Uh, and then uh, we have evolved it since then. So to give you a bit of a, uh, a summary of where we have been and where we are going, uh, there are three phases to it. Uh, so we started by having you manage your own conversations. That was the inbox. And then we evolved it a few months ago into following your friends' conversations. So if you uh, connect with your networks, we will tell you who your friends are uh, on the other networks, and then you can decide to follow them on Engageo. And that's what gave you the dashboard. Uh, uh, so if you go on the dashboard every day, uh, you will see where your friends are engaging. And these are great dipping points into uh, conversations and engagement on all of the networks, not just on uh, discuss and blogs. And then now what we are evolving into and launching next week is into a place where you can see anybody's discussions, anybody's conversations, not just your own, not just your friends, but anybody. So we're going to become, and we are becoming actually by the time this gets printed, uh, a search and discovery destination for the best online social conversations out there. So when you go to the homepage of Engageo, uh, you'll be able to see the most popular discussions that are going on, and you'll be able to dip in, uh, even if you were not involved in those discussions. And, 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 and are these discussions in? So when you say discussions, right? If you could define discussion, so what do you what do you what do you categorize by a, What do you mean by discussion? Discussion meaning the comments, the comments that are going on in the blogs that we are indexing. Yeah. At, as well as the, uh, the conversations, the back and forth on the social networks. Okay. So we define if there's more than two, if, if it's just a tweet, if it's you retweeting something, yeah. that's not a discussion. Yes. Uh, if you uh, sending a tweet, nobody responds to you, that's not a discussion. But the minute somebody starts to respond to you, uh, then it's a discussion, especially if there's more than one person, if it's three, four, five people, six people that are responding, the more the more people are engaged in those discussions, the more uh, prominence we will give to that discussion. 
and the more importance we give, we give to it, and we will display it to you accordingly. So uh, along with this discovery, there's going to be a search component. And this has been basically from day one, the vision of Engageo uh, from January, but it took us a little bit of time to implement it because we wanted to have a critical mass uh, of comments uh, so that it made sense. So that when you went and searched for conversations, you would see uh, some valuable information. And we're at that point right now where you would see that. So you'll be able to uh, create alerts on the conversations uh, about the topics that matter to you. So if you wanted to put an alert on your name uh, or on your company uh, across the social conversation space, and then you'll be able to go to engage you and do that. And this is something unique that nobody's done yet yeah. uh, to the scale, the scale that we are doing it. Uh, so we want to uh, make this available to anybody. Uh, of course, there are uh, business uh, solutions that do this, yeah. but they're yeah. But uh, we'll be the first uh, consumer-based solution uh, that allows you to generate your own alerts uh, on the social conversation space uh, at the, the scale that we are doing it right now. Uh, we are working right now with 14 different uh, APIs, uh, application programming interfaces, uh, from uh, social networks to social communities uh, to blogs uh, to uh, uh, vertical networks. Uh, so the, uh, the, the variety is there now, uh, and uh, we are indexing millions of, uh, uh, of conversations on a daily basis. So essentially, essentially, if today something is going on, uh, let's take a... On Saturday, we have a big Manchester United football game here. And uh, so if I, I, I will basically be able to look for all conversations about this game, uh, basically on Saturday across uh, discuss on blogs, across tweets, etc. So, so that, that's, that's the potential you see. Potential. I would, I would not say that it will be all of them from day one. Uh, we are gradually increasing the size of the database that yes, we have. Of course. Uh, yeah. We have designed, we have developed our own um, crawlers, crawl the APIs of yeah. these companies. Uh, so we're not just limited uh, by the users, by the engaged users that yeah. are discussing. Yeah. We have five, we are tracking uh, the profiles of five million users now overall. Yeah. Uh, so it's quite a varied amount uh, of, uh, of uh, content and information. Uh, initially, we were a little bit more biased towards the US content and a lot of US uh, uh, based uh, users, but gradually we're adding more and more globally. Uh, so you may not see all the conversations about. Uh, the football games or the mail, yeah. what Manchester. Yeah. But sure, you'll see some uh, that you might not have caught otherwise because we are searching what is below the surface. Yes, uh, agree. yeah, I see that. Exactly. When you go, if you go Google Alerts and the other typical search uh, engines, they are really giving you what the post is saying, what the story is yeah. saying, but nobody is telling you what's beneath the story. Yeah. And it's like, of the iceberg, as you well know, uh, the post may be 500 words, but the comments, 300 comments, can generate thousands more words. Yeah. And whatever is below that iceberg uh, that we are allowing you to mine uh, and get alerts from. So there's a lot of lot of talk about social, right? And 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 social, especially with you know people speculating if it's a bubble, not a bubble. Where is this heading? What is your view? You know, somebody who's uh, of course building a business around this. Well, what is what is your take on social? Sure. Uh, well, the web. When I when we say social, I like to use the word social web. It is not just social media or social networks. It is the social web. Yeah. The web is becoming social. Everything online that we're doing has a social component. Yes. We are becoming more engaged online. That is a given. That, that is not going back. Yeah. And the trend that I'm seeing is that the online world now has a chance to yeah. influence the physical world more and more. So we are becoming more advocates. Uh, online advocacy is becoming more real, is becoming more powerful, and yeah. is becoming more effective at yeah. making change happen. And I'll give you an example. Example is uh, what happened with the SOPA and PIPA bills in the U.S. <clears throat> excuse me, a few months ago, where excuse me, those bills were going to be defeated. These are the privacy bills. 
we're, we're going to be defeated in the Congress. Uh, so we're, we're, we're going to get passed. And then uh, suddenly the whole blogosphere, the comment sphere, uh, the social network started to discuss uh, those uh, those issues, uh, and and uh, basically the online world ended up defeating uh, the traditional lobbyists and the traditional world of uh, legislative uh, kind of policy making uh, because there was uh, a rise up of the blog population that were commenting very uh, aggressively and with a lot of passion, and and they ended up uh, changing those laws. I mean, this is the equivalent of what's happen in other parts of the world where uh, governments are being toppled because a revolution has started online in the social networks, uh, in the social media. And there's more and more of that that's going to happen. Uh, and uh, it's not just about changing policy, it's also about changing the minds of people, changing uh, for the good uh, of mankind. So I think uh, we're just barely starting to scratch the surface of what online advocacy can do and how online advocacy can influence uh, the physical world. And uh, we think that Engager can play a role in amplifying uh, the voices of those that want to be advocates, that want to discuss things very passionately. Like an example, uh, um, just uh, recently uh, today, uh, uh, because of what happened in New York with the Hurricane Sandy, uh, Albert, on his, Albert Wenger, the uh, USV, partner decided that he wanted to now do a Kickstarter campaign to uh, to uh, uh, come up with the best ideas for protecting New York City uh, so that these kinds of disasters do not happen, at least that the, the city is protected so that the, the damages do not happen the way to the extent that they happened yeah. here uh, the, this, this past week. And, and look where it started. It started online. He's starting it online. And there will be discussions about it uh, and, and that what's going to make things happen in the physical world. So the online world is starting discussions that are going to become important, that are going to become things that happen in the physical space. That's fascinating, William. I'm going to change tack because we're, we're close. We're, we're, we're past our 15 minute uh, mark. So, so just, I think a couple of personal questions. One is, you know, of course you're out there, you're leading, you're, you're, you're being an entrepreneur. It's, it's, it's tough. Uh, what were some defining moments, or what was a defining moment that comes to mind uh, uh, when when you think of yourself as as a leader or or as, a, or as an entrepreneur? Okay, I want to be honest with you. I don't think I have one defining moment in per se that yeah. I can say my life. But I mean, I've had some small moments where uh, I keep remembering them. Uh, it includes things like. Uh, meeting, I met, uh, I had the opportunity to spend uh, two days with Alvin Toffler back uh, in the year 2000. We were speaking uh, at the same conference in, in Chile, in Santiago, and uh, I, I uh, spent a lot of time with him. We ended up flying back together. Sorry, who, 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 is, who is this, William? Uh, I didn't cast it. Sorry, with, uh, with uh, Alvin, Alvin Toffler. Okay. Uh, Toffler. The futurist that wrote uh, Future Shock, and I mean, he was really the first futurist who, in the in the seventies, predicted a lot of what is going on right now in the right. information age. Okay. Uh, so um, he's like the dean of of what's happened uh, uh, in, in terms of future, predicting the future and and the impact of the information age on us. Okay. And that was a defining moment for me because I learned a lot from him. We ended up spending. Um, we, we flew back together from Santiago to Los Angeles. It's a long flight. Uh, and uh, and I, I learned a lot from him. It was a defining moment um, for, for my life, uh, for my professional life. Uh, and uh, I know you've asked other, other uh, of your uh, people that, you, that you've interviewed if they've had mentors that have helped them or defining yeah. mentors. I, I haven't had any official mentors, but I've had models, role models yeah. that help you. I mean, they don't know that I am being mentored by them yeah. because I'm being indirectly. I mean, we all have role models. I mean, I, I can repeat that Alvin Toffler was one of those role models that uh, I knew something about him and he influenced me. Uh, on a, recently, I can tell you, Fred Wilson is has, be, has become a great mentor uh, to me in the last year, especially. Uh, not just as an investor, but also uh, as a professional 
uh, advisor, as a mentor, as a friend, uh, I uh, benefit a lot from my relationship with uh, with, uh, with Fred, uh, and and that has uh, helped me a lot. So, so that these are two examples I can think of. Amazing! No, it's 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 great to live in a time where we can have uh, people you know online who influence us so much, right? It's it's amazing. Uh, quick, quick couple of last couple of questions. One is, is there a productivity hack? So I'm a huge fan of productivity hacks, little things that you do that, that make your day a little better or, or happier or more productive. Is there something like that, some routine or something that you would like to share? Sure. Um, there's a couple of things I, well, I do with email uh, in terms of uh, reminding me uh, of doing things. So some people have to-do lists uh, I used to have to do lists. I don't have to do lists anymore. But over every morning, I I look at what I need to do every day. Uh, but the thing I do is I email things to myself constantly, yeah. and I have something in the subject line of uh, what the action item is. So if it's a to do, I will email something to myself, and the subject line being to do. That's it. Yeah. So when I want to see what do I have to do, I search for the subject line to do every morning, yeah. and I go. Through and I write it down and I do these things. Yeah. Similarly, I can have, uh, I have another one where the subject line is listen. Yeah. I just listen. And these are uh, video, videos or, or podcasts or uh, vi things that I want to listen to, yeah. either on work, in the car. Uh, I have a long commute. It's an hour away. Uh, sometimes it's split half an hour drive, half an hour in the train. Yeah. So I spend commuting. Uh, and I search for the listen, yeah. uh, and I listen to them in the car. Uh, similarly, I have ideas for products, so I put in a product, uh, or I put in marketing, yeah. uh, I put in uh, pitch, because suppose I'm pitching the way I pitch engage you. Yeah. So think of them as I e emails to myself, yeah. with the line being four or five known categories that yeah. I back to. And that's how I organize myself. Oh, makes, that's it. Makes complete sense. A fellow psychopath. <laughs> I do the same. Really nice to hear. The final, final quick question is, uh, you know, as you know, we have a small but growing audience uh, of, of, of people listening to this, right? And, and, and seeing this. What is an idea that you would like to pass on, you know, on leadership, on, on life, an idea that, that, that inspires you? Well, the idea is, uh, I don't know if it's a new idea, but it's something that works for me is, is that to never give up. I mean, I, I am, I've been told I'm tenacious, I don't give up, I try things, and, uh, and it's a message I, I want to give to others, is to, to never give up, don't take things personally. When things don't work out, um, take what you learn from it, and don't let it affect you. Uh, because if you have any issues, if you have any problems, if you let the problem affect you, then you will not be able to deal with it. Yeah. So my baseline thinking, something I've been believing in for maybe 25 years that I, I learned it very early on, is that I never let problems get to me uh, because I, uh, I need to be in a full position to deal with these problems. So I kind of when I see a problem or an issue or a challenge, I kind of park it. I don't deal with it right away. I park it and I go and deal with it when I'm in a better state of mind in dealing, in dealing with it. Obviously, there are some things you have to deal with right away, but the astonishing thing is that you don't have to deal with every problem, yeah. every challenge right away. Yeah. You park it. Some of them will go away on their own, and some of them, all you need is a bit of thinking. You may need two days to think about something, and you come up with the idea. And then that's the, that solves it. So don't let anything affect you. Stay in a positive sense, and then you'll be in a better position to tackle those issues that you have. Brilliant. Thanks so much, William. That, hey, thank this, you. This is wonderful.